So welcome to, to Cycle Converses Design in Multimedia. So this year we are actually doing two events uh, at the same time. So uh, during the months of April, and this is the first session, till the end of May, we'll, we will have two events. So the first one is Cycle Converses Design in Multimedia, which is organized within the scope of the Bachelor and Master courses in Design and Multimedia here at the University of Coimbra. And the second event is called CMD Talks, and it's organized in the context of the doctoral program in computational media design, also here at the University of Coimbra. Um, so the first session, we will welcome the, the studio current. So the current is uh, an interdisciplinary intercultural collective working at the intersection of art, architecture, science, and technology. Current was founded by Provides, Ellie, uh, Ya, and Art. Uh, I'm sorry for not saying the last names, but I will not attempt to say them because I, for sure, I'll say them wrongly. So I prefer to keep these. Um, their collaborative digital practice is driven by an interest in the reciprocal relationships between virtual and physical spaces. Through the medium of metric cinema, current delineates the multiplicity of features in attention economy and its materials manifestation. Current has been exhibiting and teaching worldwide, including Rishki's Museum, Tent, the Bartlett UCL, Goldbot Festival, Culture Hub LA, UCLA, Sci Art Lab, Super Collider Gallery, and many more. This is uh, the bio that's available at our website. And so if you want to check it out and also the other sessions, just access the, the website. And now, without further ado, I pass on the, the floor to our guest speakers and feel free to, to start your presentation. Yeah, we're very happy to be here. And thank you so much, Juan and Pedro, for inviting us. Um, this is actually our first talk in 2023, and we're just looking forward to enjoying it with you. So hi, we're current. First, we're current. We'll, yeah, we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> hi, um, my name is Yanzing, uh, and um, basically I'm an artist, but with a, let's say, solid theoretical background. That's why my art is uh, located somewhere in between this, like, artistic side and, like, engineering or programming side. So, um yeah, uh, from that perspective, uh, I will try to explain the current situation that mm -hmm. we are experiencing right now. Cool. So, hi, I'm Provides. Um, I'm actually architecture designer and researcher. Currently, I am studying at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and also teaching at the Bartlett School of Architecture. Hi, uh, my name is Artyom Kinevskih, and I'm artist and machine learning engineer. Uh, yeah, I studied computer sciences and uh, spent some time working on like particle acceleration and oh. urban, urban analysis and uh, different uh, technical stuff. But uh, I've always uh, been interested in arts. So at some point, I uh, moved to this field and uh, currently I'm working with artists uh, by helping them to implement machine learning uh, approaches in the, their art and I also teach in um, machine learning for artists. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Eli Jotiva. I'm from Bulgaria, but I'm based in Los Angeles, and I work at the intersection of art and science. I'm always looking for ways to bridge the physical and the digital through light installations, ephemeral objects, XR projects. I like to collaborate with scientists that use alternate imaging tools and data to kind of reveal the invisible forces that influence us. Um, like in my last big project, I used an MRI scanner to extract the nerves around my heart, my vagina, and my feet, and then I presented them as an audiovisual installation and an AR experience. Um, I also work at as um, 
a visualization research artist at the Advanced Visualization Lab at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, I teach in various schools and universities, and I run my own studio practice. Cool, cool stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, what is current? Um, I guess when we first conceptualize it, Back in 2019, it was at the intersection of these four core ideas, which is the live stream economy, volumetric cinema, AI deepfakes, and personalized narrative. And I think for this talk, we would like to just look back and see how much has changed and how much has not changed. In some ways, current is a mashup of all the digital content that exists or is yet to exist. Current, it's a project that stands at the convergence of four technological ideas, but actually they are also very socially related. We don't wish to speculate on how this potential can help to authenticate the truth, especially in situations of global crisis. As an affective experience, it presents you the active viewing participant with the current of audiovisual sensations that entrance your perception of time and space. It imagines being able to step into a river of real time content that responds and regenerates from your embodied experiences, in a sense, producing a biofeedback system between your body and digital culture itself. When current guys told me about their project, I was completely hooked up by the idea of volumetric cinema. The idea that we can break up uh, linearity of cinematic narrative and make it not only time, but also spatially distributed multi-branch narrative seems to me the next step of uh, cinematic language. Virtual reality and gaming industry converging with streaming and meeting services providing people with spatial dimension in their communication. Not only communication, but the whole approach for perceiving events are changing, going from discrete constrained points of view to continuous navigatable space formed from this initial data. Let's see, fill in the gaps between evidences. Yeah, so that's not really the film. That's just um, an introduction to the film. If you want to watch the whole thing, you can just go on YouTube. We're open source. Um, I guess we'll, we'll talk over also a bit of the ideas that we were discussing back in 2019, including predictive modeling and outsourcing imagination, um, which, which are some of the case studies we think that artificial intelligence might actually step into when you have a continuous current of yourself from yesterday, tomorrow, the day before, and when you're mixing your tomorrow with my yesterday, we're essentially doing a predictive modeling um, in a collaborative sense. And to outsource imagination, it's also inspiring how we're going from montage to transitioning, which we're really just compressing frames. And once we expand it, you fill in 
the bits with content aware, which is sort of like how neural networks like GANs are uh, working nowadays that you compress into a model and then you expand it again. Guys want to add anything? Uh, probably not right now. Cool. Markovka. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe the idea of blockchain cameras as a way to authenticate truth in an AI landscape that's artificially created. Um, how can we like chain together cameras that might be using alternative frequencies to authenticate truth or um, existing on the blockchain, as well as ideas around micro licensing um, from various small aspects of life landscapes and how the act of seeing and entering this kind of current can become a sort of currency. So our attention and our economy, the attention economy and our gaze becomes part of that currency of exchange. Yeah, we, we also had this big debate or argument of whether current is a platform, which is like a hype word back in 2019, or it's just a cinema, but obviously now we know. Um, yeah, and we were really intrigued by the non-human perspective, because when we're researching a live stream, we see that there are actually billions of minutes of videos of bear cams or eagle cams or looking at absolutely nothing. And it's a also this mundane moments rather than the cinematic moment that we think will actually overturn how we produce because once we are doing live stream we actually have this infinite feed of data together and when we match that together the narrative is not linear anymore yeah we were really inspired by like long um long-term cinema and the idea of in integrating alternative perspectives, non-human, whether that's landscapes or animals, into the story to produce more empathetic experience of what cinema might look like. Or machines, uh, like autonomous car perspective. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and the the thing here is uh, that, like, cinema is is a, is a tool uh, how to tell a story which evolves in 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 huge amount of time. Let's say, yeah, like. A uh, year of camera watching the North Pole, for example, where most of the time nothing happens, but uh, the machine have this ability and and time, let's say, yeah, to see all of these frames and collect the the final edit for you with the thing that you. Uh, in uh, you able to perceive in a short amount of time yeah this is from just uh, source information compressed into the let's say let's say cinema yeah and just tie this back to the cinema. <laughs> yeah just tie this back to the blockchain camera once we've accumulated enough data we can actually just reconstruct theoretically, the entire world with all this infinite live stream. And that actually authenticates the truth because you're not getting to the image and not seeing what's behind the camera. You're actually seeing every point of the same event. Yeah, it becomes uh, really hard to um, uh, to lie to, to the system because each of the camera uh, has its uh, own data position and uh, own information. and it, since they are interconnected, it's it's hard to um, fake something there because uh, if something has changed in one camera, like other cameras will feel this. Yeah. Yeah, so ultimately from this talk, we wanted to say is that it's really not about what type of new tag will come out tomorrow, but how our modes of production will actually change due to innovative ways of collaboration and creation. So that will happen tomorrow. And we wanted to start from this concept of uh, photometric cinema. Like, what is it? We actually don't know, like the rest of you, but we know there are relevant ideas like virtual reality, video gaming, and now it's really for us to define from our modes of production what photometric cinema is and what the added value can be. And for a preliminary, we're putting forward that actually is a spectrum of space and place. And what control the spectrum is actually the autonomy of user being able to participate in the system. Ouch. 
Okay, yeah. We're going to do something fun. We're going to watch some movies. Yeah, this this talk will be organized more or less about uh, cinema and like volumetric cinema in a way, uh, but with a um, more expanded uh, look on that through the like neural networks and all the recent breakthroughs in technology and how they affect to uh, the term cinema itself. Yeah. So this is the kid from the corridor and you can see the cameras behind him and this gives sort of estrangement and then he stops and he look at this most mundane door 237 it's like the rest of the door in the hotel nothing special about it but then we're scared it's almost like the everyday object why does it make us scared and i think it has a lot to do with the space because of the corridor which is like an extremely elongated proportion and it gives this uncanny feeling. So even when, and the most generic the doors are, the more scary it gets. And then at the end of it, you see a perfectly symmetrical um, figure standing in this very narrow space. And suddenly it turns this into a place, a scary place. So really, I, I love Kubrick because what it does is just giving all this arrangement in a 2D frame. And then it turns the space into a place. For instance, this is the main uh, space that everyone passed by, but then it's actually not such a simple space. You see um, Native American mural on the left, and then you see this super westernized way of decorating a home. You see the fireplace, which is super domestic, but then the work furnitures are super managerial. So for me, there's so much contradiction in this space that makes it uncanny and scary in a sense. And uh, I would like to add uh, that uh, this uh, Shining movie uh, is kind of happening in this uh, liminal space environment, and yeah. um, which is a, a, a big theme right now. Or, I, I don't know mm. if that's a good word, big theme, but there there are certain videos on YouTube called Backrooms, uh, uh, which they are working with this theme of infinite liminal spaces, and they um, it's it's a lot of that kind of videos. Yeah, they may last like really long time, and they all about some person stuck in this liminal space forever yeah it's just going from one corridor to another to from one room to another and it's all happening in kind of hotelish uh space um and it also produces the same feeling this uncanny feeling mm. yeah so also in this really uncanny space you have the most architectural object ever which is the physical model before a building is produced. And this time it's a physical model of the maze. And what this does is that it facilitates a sort of authoritative masculine gaze because you're looking down into the object that you create. So it's the creator perspective, right? And naturally the guy who gazed at it is the bread maker in a household. And he didn't choose just anywhere to write his novel, not in the hotel room, which will be more quiet, not in the semi outdoor space where he can get fresh air, but he chooses really big empty lobby where he asserts his authority as the writer um, in a space. The next thing is this sort of meme that I always go back to. I love the tie, but um, I wasn't born when this tie was actually really common in the 70s and 80s. So again, Kubrick took the most mundane common object and turned that into a symbol of scary tie that I'm sure nobody's going to wear it uh, since the movie. So that's why I, I just love him. And I think from cinema, we can also learn a lot about the cultural landscape. For instance, I'm a Chinese and in Chinese cinema, when you have a scene where everyone's dining around the table, you would always have the camera looking at everyone because you're trying to, because dining around a round table is like an interrelation between people. It shows the relationship. But for a lot of Western cinema, what it does is that when you're eating, it zooms into 
your face because when you're eating you're relaxed you're consuming and then the actor will sort of uh, show the hidden side of his emotional feeling so just by analyzing this frame and how the camera is positioned within a room you can already analyze the different uh, cultural landscape representation etc this scene um, we look back a lot when we were producing current is a scene that everything everywhere happening all at once obviously um and i also love this movie because there are no protagonists everyone's a protagonist and the there's no hero journey because the only journey you get to take it's to not die you're not you you win it by not dying and at the same time this scene is sort of like a it's not a junk space but it's junk time because everyone's stuck in this harbor they're sort of like in this limbo that Yancy was uh, mentioning. And it is through the actor's position towards the camera, you, you can see where the camera is throughout the whole scene. So inspired by it, we sort of just put it into photogrammetry. And this was our first experiment of the time voxel, where you can see all the line traces back to where the camera is. It's not perfect, but so you can see traces of it. And what it does is really just adding information because you're extracting from 2D and then expand that to 3D. But what this one is doing here is that you have X, Y, C. You swap the C with time. So it's a time voxel. You turn it 90 degree and then you smash it onto a 2D frame. And from this, it's sort of like a histogram of cinema. You can see the frequency of the different scenes, the frequency of the temple, the transitioning moments of the movie. It is a montage of not the not the event, but the transitional moments. And this play with two point five D actually starts from the very beginning of cinema, right? Like this journey to the moon is actually the perfect example of two point five D movie. And once you stack it up, it reveals the traces, the agency of the cinematic object. Um, every time there's a new technology that comes up, two point five D is the first thing that we experience. And same for the AI cinema. We actually looked at this together like last week. It's just a perfect example of how new technology provoked 2.5D explorations. None of this is 3D, but it gives the illusion. And even the AI doesn't understand 3D. But how does it really generate all of the uh, camera move, all of the angles, et cetera? Um, Arctam is probably the expert on it. <laughs> but yeah, I think we'll talk more about AI cinema later on. Uh, the... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really crucial uh, point. And I think I will mention this uh, later, but if, um... When we were making current, one of our uh, uh, main ideas was uh, about volumetric cinema, about this big shift from 2D, um, uh, let's say, content to 3D. Yeah. And uh, what is uh, happening right now after four years is, uh, as always in a, in a human history, it's it's not that obvious how it will happen yeah and so it all uh, going not the like real 3d um, direction it appeared to be uh, like like a hi hybrid vision uh, uh, so it's a uh, like laden narrow space where you can navigate in 3d yeah but it's not a real 3d it's a um, um it's kind of another uh approach for that yeah in a sense it's almost 1d um pan right and pull back stop uh, early examples of uh, yeah. uh 3d yeah. navigation in in 2d content <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think uh, this scene from uh, Blade Runner is a perfect uh, example of how yeah. modern text-to-video neural networks work. Uh, because he 
ask right. uh, the machine to show him uh, some uh, perspectives and some uh, images of the room that are uh, that wasn't on the photograph that he oh. found on the place. And uh, actually, it's the same mechanism how you can generate videos uh, today, just providing a prompt to the neural network and uh, then receiving a new uh, imagery. Uh, and you can also like provide uh, the initial image uh, that will be like a starting point for the whole video or yeah, for the image sequence. So I think it was kind of prophetic. <laughs> video and uh, especially uh, there are uh, like uh, this text to image uh, neural networks they are uh, like general but there are some specific neural networks that are trained to reconstruct the environment uh, just from one photo and you can uh, also like uh, navigate this environment uh, so that you'll continuously create uh, like uh, different points of view on the same room of course uh, it will be not a real environment, but uh, anyway, it uh, looks pretty realistic. Oh, yeah, yeah and this is, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is a real good uh, point about um, what we'll have next in our talk, uh, talk is, uh, is the way uh, like interface works in, in this example, because as you may see the, um, uh, Harrison Ford just talking to the to the to this tool. Yeah, it's it's um, like audio input, uh, and it's not in like traditional interface with like a lot of uh, I don't know, keyboard, mouse, and so on. He just talks to the machine. Yeah, we we, we feel so strongly about this clip because. It, it was actually the moment when we first thought about blockchain camera. Um, 2019 was a year of a lot of stuff, a lot of big protests. And the media, the journalists, we always only see what's in front of the camera. We don't see what's behind the camera. We don't see the people at home. So this scene where he can just move the virtual camera a little bit and see the real person behind the column, that was really powerful for us. Yeah, and this is really like not a new idea. If we just go back to the Dutch golden age, probably the, the Arnofini portrait, I love it so much. Um, it really gives the sense of space. You, you see the light coming from the window behind the couple falling on the floor. It really elongates the proportion of the room. And then the bed that is slightly higher than normal, it makes the room way more intimate. So just by arranging object, the proportion of the space has changed. And if you look into the center piece, which is the mirror, you begin to see this blue uh, person who might be the one that is looking into the room. And suddenly you're, it creates so much question that uh, the story visualizes in front of you just by playing with perspective. Of course, another perfect example is Las Meninas. All of the architects love this painting because Michel Foucault loved this painting because he wrote about it in um, The Order of Things. And it's a very playful painting because when you look closely at it, the painter is inside a painting. And it's one of the earliest painting in the Western history that the painter is portrayed in the painting. So you understand how important it is to the royal family. And he's looking at perhaps himself, but if he's looking at himself, it means that he's looking out to the painting into a mirror. But then on the other side, there's also a mirror. So it, it gives you this trick on perspective where you don't really know whether you are the couple in the mirror or you're the uh, painter in the mirror or you're just another person in the room. So much mystery is tied to this just by playing with perspective. Yeah, so we really think that that overturns what authorship is. And 300 years ago, it's by portraying the author inside the room. But 300 years after today, authorship is overturned by this collaborative scene where, you know, we, we have, we're, we're not just frame to frame transition, we're world to world transition. So the user navigate the space, they are also part of producing the narrative as they navigate it. Yeah, and for this us, is, oh, sorry. Uh, 
Yeah, th th this is um, an important thing uh, when back in the days, uh, or even right now, we have this like movie director, yeah, and he um, is uh, doing the, the montage and you actually, you see what the director want you to see, yeah? Uh, because it, it, it always manipulates your uh, attention and like changing the the scenery and stuff. But uh, what this uh, movement from 2D uh, content to 3D means is that uh, actually you, uh, like in most cases, uh, you are moving through the space and controlling what you see. So, uh, in, in that case, the uh, the producers of this content they they make in an environment, yeah, and not the actual frame, not the actual point of view uh, provided by the director, yeah. In that case, like director and viewer, uh, they are kind of merging in one substance. When, for example, you watch uh, the movie, and uh, another thing. Um, like happening at this point is uh for example in vr space if you experiencing like you yourself in 3d space um it's really um uh, like this traditional movie cut not really work not really works because uh it breaks it breaks the whole world world around you yeah and replace it with another one and this is kind of hard for your brain when, like, it's probably it's uh, it's emergency for your body, yeah. If everything uh, changes all of a sudden, probably you should like run or something like because it's earthquake or uh, I don't know sudden teleportation. <laughs> yeah. So that's why. Um, we are talking about this world-to-world -world, uh, montage uh, that probably will help us to to perceive. Um, yeah, if you can just mute this and go to like six forty-five. This is a we can share this link with you guys too. But it's a really great visualization of uh, volumetric cinema and um, the the idea of being a to reconstruct a space and then enter inside of different viewers. So when you have this 3D space, you're able to pop in and out of different characters, right? Like you can be the bandit, you can be the horse, you can be the sky, you can be the bird in the sky. Um, so yeah, that's a really good uh, link. We'll share it with you guys. Arctan? Yeah, and uh, when we speak about volumetric uh, cinema, um, we couldn't uh, like ignore the whole experience uh, of uh, game design because uh, ga uh, games are um, video games are uh, in certain point also like uh, volumetric storytelling, and uh, it has uh, a bit, uh, its own context, its own specifics because uh, there is a, like. Uh, some rules of the game, some aim, uh, like like some goals to achieve, and so on, which uh, can be like uh, omitted in the cinema. But uh, anyway, we still have uh, a lot of things in common. So, uh, 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 please go back. Uh, yeah. So, uh, one one of the things is uh, how the uh world is actually built uh, like uh, we can define the story the main characters we can define the rules how this uh, world is uh, um operates but the high level is uh, an environmental storytelling so it's uh, how we can actually tell the story without telling anything just showing the environment so uh, it's a uh, big way like uh, how we can navigate uh, a player or um, viewers through the space through the story by designing certain uh, like uh, environment like we can uh, like uh, block uh, the ways how uh, the player can go so 
uh, we can lead uh, him, him or her to a certain point uh, where a certain event will happen and so on. Uh, we can add some uh, uh, NPC characters. We can add some details that telling us uh, something about epoch or um, yeah uh, about events happening in this area and so on. And another uh, way how we can uh, affect uh, the um, like the viewer's emotion is uh, to use camera. Like uh, in uh, video games, you can. Like depending on how you uh, locate the camera, you can achieve different uh, effects. Like uh, for the strategy games, uh, uh, the god uh, view, like uh, from the top to the scene, is uh, more preferable because uh, the player has to see the whole scene, not just a part of it. But uh, for the other games, like action games, you should see uh, provide scan. Uh, uh, move to the next. Right. Yeah. So yeah, for the action uh, uh, games, you need to see the world uh, from uh, uh, the perspective of, of the main character, so you can uh, actually feel the connection to the ca uh, character. And uh, sometimes, uh, like uh, it can be a dy dynamic. Like you can see the character from a little bit aside. So uh, when nothing happens, but when uh, the scene became intense, you can uh, get uh, even closer. Like uh, on the next slide, um, uh, uh, yeah. Like for example, for the horror movies, uh, they usually uh, use uh, this first uh, person view because uh, it uh, sets uh, like uh, the viewer, the player, like inside the scene. So. Uh, it actually can feel what's going on there, and uh, uh, like the the rule, rule of thumb here is that uh, the most distant uh, the camera, the like uh, 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 the less emotions, the less empathy we uh, have to uh, like uh, we feel to the uh, character, and uh, the close, uh, closer it is, the more we can relate to uh, to them. Yeah, so I think in uh, I think it works both in games, in uh, cinema, and uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I really recommend to watch these uh, videos. Uh, they are anal analyze how it's actually done in uh, in games and uh, in volumetric uh, like environment, and also there are a bunch of useful links and in the comments. <laughs> also recommend <laughs> to check them. <laughs> yeah, but by the way, the, the, uh, the the shot from Shining uh, provides uh, showed before. It's it's also a good and strange example of this third person uh, kind of camera in cinema, uh, like back in the days. Yeah, um, because it 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 makes this emotional uh situation with just the camera work yeah so the camera is yeah. always behind this um a little bicycle uh um and we we strange feel strangely related to this uh, situation mm -hmm. with this simple approach yeah Yeah, so with the characters in a video game, we, we also want to talk about the digital personas nowadays. Yeah, over the last few years, we've seen this kind of rise of CG or computer generated influencers. Um, like I'm sure you're all familiar with little Michaela, who has like 3 million followers. Um, and her account is run by a creative agency. It follows her life in this way that she goes through breakups, even, you know, especially during the COVID lockdowns, we've had this surge of CG influencers from all over the world kind of gaining popularity on social media. And it really like, Mm, brings up implications on mortality. Um, what is really important here, these characters can never die. And they present this sort of unrealistic idea of what bodies should look like. And I think it's it's an important relationship there between AI and our mortality, right? Um, what does this communicate to our real human aging bodies as, as we die? And maybe what is the aspect that we can bring as humans um, that is that is precisely related to our mortality that is different than AI? 
And uh, here, um, I, yeah, yeah. Here is uh, also some interesting things uh, to uh, to say about the actual tag behind this. Yeah. Uh, so one uh, one of them uses uh, like 3D models. Yeah. Uh, like pure 3D models, and they are kind of personas. Some of them uses hybrid approach when they like replace the head with a 3D one um, and use the photo of the real thing, let's say, real environment real, with real people just replacing the face. And um, another thing um, is, uh, for example, uh, deep fake. Deep fake just replace the face, yeah. but uh, there are some weird examples uh, when, for example, you have initially you have a, a 3D character and um, you want him to be like more more real, yeah. And you making a, a database for the deep fake of your fake 3D person and like replace it um, in the real footage. So that's why it's it's not a pure um, uh, replacement. I don't know how to explain. It's just uh, this um, re recursive neural network um, where one is the source for another, uh, or maybe the source is a three D, not a like neural or real photo. Yeah, and uh, right now with the uh, development of stable diffusion and control net, it uh, it gets mm. even further. Like uh, uh, the case that Yancy uh, is uh, oh. describing, it's when you take a 3D model and uh, uh, like place uh, the face of this 3D model to the uh, like real head. But uh, with the control net, you can use a 3D model as a depth map that controls the neural network to generate completely new person uh, with the same form of the head. So it's mm. uh, like uh, different techniques and uh, different possibilities to generate like as a new people or uh, use um, like uh, this uh, 3D puppet, uh, puppets uh, to create uh, like uh, fake videos of uh, existing people as well. So uh, a big mm. topic, I think. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, from the present to the past, this is just for some history and context of how the rigging uh, technology has developed over time. From the earliest forms of motion tracking and animation was used uh, using rotoscope devices where animators would literally use real film footage to draw over the actors in order to produce this kind of realistic movement of the animated characters like in Snow White or Alice in Wonderland. Um, and then since then, we've had VFX animation industries using multiple sensors or machine vision algorithms to compute the exact position of the body. Um, producing what is called a rigged virtual skeleton that relies on these data points as they're moving through space. Um, it's usually called motion tracking or capture, mocap uh, mo for short. And now we have neural nets that allow for pose estimation of like one single image without any fancy sensors can give us that kind of movement of the body through time. Yeah, I also really like this uh, 3D model that we see on the bottom of the page. Uh called the SMPL uh, 3D model, and it's parametric model where you can adjust all the parameters and depending on parameters, it uh, takes different shapes, different sizes, different faces. So basically the neural network here can adjust it uh, to fit uh, the certain photo. Yeah. Well, uh, almost all uh, humanity like, represented in this mathematic, uh, mathematical model at least wide range yeah and here is the um, uh, latest example of uh, how you can achieve the motion uh, capture um, like at home uh, so and um, it's 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 really like democratizing the the field 
because uh, yeah previous time you have to um, spend a lot of time uh, spend a lot of money to have uh, this motion capture suit with this special markers or inertial sensors and right now it's just a bunch of iPhones uh, um, standing in a, in a circle and pointing the um, central point so I, I've tested both of them and like this move AI is just making um, like ready for production animation just with the use of two or let's say six iPhones, which is dramatically cheaper and um, accessible. Yeah, and the second element we think is the environment reconstruction. Which is already has been happening with Google Earth uh, for some time and the ability to jump into any part of the world through it that is reconstructed through different satellite um, technology. And Markovka next. <laughs> um, and then there's also uh, the plugin for Unreal Engine. <coughs> Was released and presents uh, photogrammetry scans of the whole planet available for geospatial games. So anybody can download this plugin and use it in their Unreal um, Engine marketplace yeah. and visit Unreal. physical environments in 3D. Yeah, and actually, yeah. you can use this Cesium, it's an online platform. Yeah, where you can uh, upload your 3D scans and uh, they have a nice. 3D tiling uh, tool, so you can also use it in uh, web VR uh, by loading like huge locations. So it's uh, really nice. I'm really a big fan of Cesium. So yeah. basically, Cesium is just a platform for segmentation, big amounts of data, uh, which leads us to like possibility of having the whole planet. Um, to experience the whole planet uh, through the 3D like yeah. ga gaming, okay. yeah. Like Microsoft Flight Simulator, but on like a city yeah. scale. Yeah. Yeah, and here's what we um, mentioned before that, uh, for example, uh, when we were ma making current, uh, the the approach was like this true 3D, yeah, like how how much we can um, like upload into the model and navigate uh, these 3D spaces. But this one is the, another step forward uh, where 3D and neural uh, like merges together because this is the hybrid uh, view uh, and the the one of the biggest uh, advantages of nerves is you can imagine that it's like a 3d like like 3d uh, reconstruction photo scan or that kind of things but they have uh, shaders on uh, every surface so um you kind of skip in this big big stage where you're drawing all the textures on each object and uh making materials out of it and here is like a compressed everything what you need to visually express uh the world around you <laughs> And yeah, recently we saw the an, another step forward towards these guys to merge together. It's like Unreal Engine uh, uses think, uh, nerves to. Hmm? Yeah, well, sorry, Jens, for interrupting. Uh, I just uh, explain a little bit what's going on. Too excited. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because uh, what we saw on the previous slide in previous video and what we have seen here is a neural rendering so it's not an actual 3d model but it's a, an environment that was reconstructed from the multiple photos like 
almost the same uh, like photogrammetry but uh, even more advanced because uh, because uh, the neural networks are like different shape uh, di differentiable and they can uh, reconstruct even those parts of the scene that are not on the photos so it gives you a better uh, like uh, scene representation and uh, what the guys did here in this plugin is uh, that they mixed uh, these two ways of representing 3d uh, environment yes um, uh, like uh, this neural rendering with uh, whoops uh, so you you can much. see the uh, visual marks of the nerve is for example this table yeah the camera that's around the table and you see the um, how it reflects the the light around and this is not possible for example, table and uh, table and uh, vegetation they have different optical properties. But in terms of like traditional photogrammetry, you will have just color information and geometry geometry information, but not this optical qualities. So yeah, in this example, uh, we see how uh all all that advantages they're coming together in this um yeah in this game engine yeah there's also a lot of discussion about digital twins or volumetric replicas of cities especially around the hype of the metaverse um and in our usually in our workshops we like to teach our participants how to extract terrains um from cities from satellite databases and then to start more critically thinking about how we can infuse those digital spaces and the replicas of environments with the kind of invisible data that exists, um, that's there, that's available to us that we might not be able to feel with our bodies. So how can we show what is not normally seen in the real world? And next, an example of that is like a project using real-time environmental data inside of simulations is Rafiq Anadol's um, project where he has a digital twin map of Boston overlaid with wind patterns that he's pulling in real time from weather data APIs. Next. I also have a project about that, but it's not in the slides. Um, an example of also using real-time environmental data um, and how can we use frequencies that exist beyond the visible spectrum as a way to kind of validate the authenticity of reality. So thinking of the way that a hologram functions on money to validate its purpose, but instead translating that to cinematic space. So in some of our early um, deep fake discussions, we were wondering what if we can take this expanded color that's available for advanced camera capturing technologies um, in order to advance um, or validate the authenticity of footage. Yeah, so we want to summarize what our vision is with the pink slide, which is the power of the collaborative pipeline. Um, these are all of the roles that is needed in a cinema scene for you to actually output a movie. And today with artificial intelligence, there's just four of us, and then we're able to make something in two weeks. And when we teach the workshop, the students are able to make something also in two weeks. So we we see how the power of the open source is operating here. And uh, this is also important theme. Uh, I've noticed um, like no nowadays is that um, I, I have a feeling that is a big shift happening from let's say tools. <laughs> Uh, yeah, when you, for example, you have a hammer and you can like uh, do what hammer could do. Yeah, but you're doing it with your hand. But uh, what we see right now is that uh, these neural networks, for example, they, they can assist you, they can help you, they um, uh, can make a lot of work for you but it's not the same as the hammer uh, in your hand yeah it's more like a person you talk so um i think it's it's really important to understand uh when, when you work with neural networks that it, it's uh that's why it's like human artificial executors yeah uh, 
it's it's not human and the tools it's a uh, human and non-human working together and this is also uh, i don't know right now it looks uh, kind of old yeah but it was just a year ago uh, actually this breakthrough or two years ago um so this virtual production is uh, what is important about uh, this in our talk is that uh, production and post-production they merging together also because uh, you you are experiencing in the real time on the on the like filming uh, side uh, you can see the final frame of the movie and before it was impossible like totally. All what you had was some uh, storyboards and like some visualization how it possibly could be, but um, and this also affects how uh, how for example director uh, behave yeah, and how the whole team uh, mm. operates and how you can like switch ideas right on the stage or. Um, yeah, before it was simply impossible because it was like planned before. Yeah, and even if you understood that this is uh, this is not work, um, you 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 still uh, super limited in that case. But yeah, right right now it's uh, more flexible. Yeah, the real time feedback loop between different roles on a scene. Yeah. And since we like explained a lot of uh, um, instruments, they sound kind of chaotic uh, and they, it's a different field and so on. But um, that's why we have some, um, let's say, platforms or places where all these different data can gather. And for example, this is uh omniverse by nvidia and this is it's a, i think it's even um, it's, it's hard to explain what what that because it's not a really just game engine like unreal engine yeah omniverse is a is a wider thing and it can incorporate a way way uh more things inside of this one like environment, yeah. Uh, for example, part of this omniverse is a special um, piece of software where, where you can test your, uh, for example, real robot, robo arm or uh, autonomous driver, yeah. And all these uh, simulations, they're happening inside the omniverse and they connect it to the real uh, car or robot or whatever so in that case it's forming another feedback loop between the, the whole 3d world and the real parts and like in the real world and they fit in back each other so this is also uh, i think big shift in um in understanding we even don't have the the proper words right now for that for example in video calls this omniverse but um uh, probably it's something else it's like more expanded yeah and and i think how it affects us as real human in a society is that especially for architects is that the financing between uh, the modes of production has totally changed. Before, each of the software charges you a thousand US dollar a year. And now because they form this financial alliance um, where, where they're able to share data between one another. So the whole financing becomes micro values that sometimes it's in the form of data licensing. Other times it's in a form where you have advertising and it's not anymore where we have to crack the software, but more like we used to free uh, production service and in return we're contributing data to the system 
And of course, we see that in a Creative Commons, but uh, not in monetary value, but in credentials. Um, we have three summary ideas. This is uh, the second one is the automated cinema with uh, the language models. Uh, yeah, here is some examples of latest advancement in artificial uh, cinema, and uh, you can see that it somehow looks like it's uh, more like a joke. Yeah, but. Um, uh, for sure, uh, there, there are. Uh, uh, there is big future of, of that uh, kind of things. And on, uh, for example, on the left, it's uh, like fully generated inside of uh, like neural network. So out, outcome is uh, the sequence of 2D frames. Yeah, and it, it has no source in 3D or what in other space. Yeah, it's just born uh, 2D. And on, on the right side is the examples of um, 3D. Uh, um, so uh, um, on the right side, it's collaboration between people and um, neural networks. But uh, the the bottom one is um, is an infinite live stream of this uh, imaginary Im imagined by neural network characters uh, uh, who provides yeah, them uh, with dialogue yeah yeah it's like a sitcom generated by uh, uh, gpt and uh, visual uh, visualized also with uh, i think neural networks yeah. uh, i think it was visualized with just um uh, yeah, it's some... like a 3D scene, but yeah, uh, somehow yeah, but dialogues where to put uh, the characters. Yeah, um, and uh, another thing, yeah, like uh, we mentioned GPT, and I think it's a big uh, topic right now. All these large language models, and um, I think uh, it uh, opens up a lot of uh, possibilities for automated cinema, like uh, in terms of. Uh, uh production of aut automated scenarios uh automated dialogues uh, you can even uh, create like uh, um uh dialogues between two characters like there is um, a website called uh, infinite conversation uh between uh, werner herzog and uh Tovo Gizek. Uh, it's i think it's quite br bright uh, example of how the neural networks to uh like uh create uh, certain like uh, scenes certain uh, dialogues that uh, never uh, never happened uh, in the real life and uh, uh when we're talking about language models uh, i think uh, we can uh notice this shift uh, the paradigm shift i think uh, from the graphic user interface to text or to audio maybe language user interface let's say so uh because um it, it's much more natural for people to give instruction with uh, the voice rather than clicking mouse or keyboard uh, so right now we have these computers closer to our like uh, bi biological reality yeah? let's say so because we can uh, see the, uh, the output and uh, instruct the computer with our voice and uh yeah it's pretty cool uh right yeah, well, like I when, think, when we start uh, the computer with our by bio, like biofeedback or our gaze or or it's more subtle affective aspects of our bodies that are Kartoshka. <laughs> oh yeah and uh, and also um when we talk about uh neural networks and uh, generative neural networks especially uh, provides can you show the next slide about uh, model cannibalism Marakovka. Uh, Marakovka, yeah <laughs> uh, so uh, there is a big uh, problem appears because uh, the amount of generated content uh, uh, that was produced by neural networks like uh, with mid journey with uh, stable diffusion uh, chat gpt whatever it uh, uh, grows exponentially um, 
because uh, everyone uh, beca uh, become uh, AI experts these days uh, <laughs> and uh, contribute to this uh, movement. Yeah, and uh, this on on one uh, on, on the one hand, it's uh, really amazing how easy right now to create the content with the neural networks because like two years ago or maybe even a year ago, you have to be uh, like. A little, uh, a little, a little bit programmer. Extra. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit programmer. <laughs> yeah, and uh, right now you don't need anything but no uh, like uh, the ability to type uh, the instruction. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have the problem that uh, all of these models they are trained uh, on the data uh, scraped from internet, like uh, either it's images or text. Uh, uh, whatever or videos or video generative uh, models uh, but uh, as, uh, uh, as soon uh, we like uh, threw out a lot of uh, generated content to the internet the next models uh, the next uh, neural networks will be trained on this uh, generated contact uh, content as well so uh, they uh, were mm. like somehow it themselves and uh, produce a new kind of uh, uh, media that is uh, no uh, like uh, no longer real because uh, the like uh, the no longer based feature, on the real yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no no longer based on the real so um, I think it's kind of uh, like fake faking the reality because uh, <laughs> uh, here yeah we are moving from the real world like to the digital one and then we substitute the real world uh, in this digital reality so it's quite scary but uh, also it's quite inspiring because uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's quite interesting what kind of uh, stuff uh, the computers will produce like in five years uh, we would be similar to the world outside the window or it will be a completely different stuff. Marakovka. Uh, yeah, this, this is also the continuation of um, uh, the same topic is, uh, for example, right now, whatever you make and post in the internet would be the, will be the, um, the part of the, future data sets. So you basically, whatever you do, doesn't matter uh, how many likes you have on that, how many people watch this, this is going to be a part of the um, artificial intelligence like to come, yeah? So we kind of, everybody forming this, uh, this monster of this, or, or this beauty, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably it's the uh, biggest uh, thing. So keep Beauty keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. And what I also wanted to add, um, could you revert back to the? Um, uh, yeah, this this one, like I said before, um, this shift from uh, from tool to. Per person persona yeah uh, is also yeah. Uh, in terms of um, interface i think we have what we have now is shift from navigation to communication uh, which means like before we had these uh, interfaces with like pages with buttons with something so if you want uh, to to reach certain place you have to go through these labyrinths of like windows, yeah, and to find the final thing you want. But uh, in, with this audio or text inputs, you uh, you saying where you want to go like straight away, yeah. You're not saying that I want to open window one, window three, window five. You want uh, you you just saying where you want to go, and you like appear there. And this is also, I think, epistemic uh, shift in that case. Oh my God, Yancy is pronouncing a death of Windows. 
And, you know, <laughs> it's natural that Microsoft purchased OpenAI. <laughs> it's not with our reason. Yeah, they feel the same. I see. I know. It's like oh, the most cinematic thing is the stock market. Um, this is the last thing, which is the participatory cinema, which is how the collaborative pipeline and the automation actually enable human agency in more collaboration. So we've been teaching workshop free and open to all around the world. Uh, we teach the pipeline, which updates itself every two weeks now, I think. And some of our work and our students' work get to be exhibited. And the most magical thing is that because we are always teaching online workshop and some of them have never met each other. And then they manage to like form a group, a collective, and then they publish a, a real academic paper based on just meeting virtually from the workshop, which I, I think is a totally whole new world. And this is one of the most recent workshops we taught in Hong Kong, where after watching the cinema, we actually invite citizens back to um, remodel urban design, stimulated by storytelling from the world building, which I think... Um, it can do so much more add a value to social problems, to urban problems than, you know, what 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 we think is just making weird stuff uh, on chat GPT. But no, actually, <laughs> so much yeah, more can happen. Uh, another good point about this uh, Hong Kong project is that it's all related uh, related to the actual site, like real, real yeah. um, part Local of life. Hong Kong. Uh, and... The guys we are interacting with the the people who live there, who experience this, um, let's say, area, yeah, and they uh, re reimagined uh, that together with artificial intelligence, uh, local community, and the uh, the guys itself. Uh, so I think it's a it's a interesting. Uh, like ecosystem happening. Yeah, ecosystem. Yeah, so that's us. <clears throat> Sorry, we're running a little bit late in time, but um, welcome to get in touch with us and follow us on Instagram. We are friendly people. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Do we still want to do questions or are we completely out of time? Yeah. Do we have questions? We have many questions here. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? I mean, uh, your presentation was very interesting. Uh, it, it, I'm actually having some difficulty to formulate my thoughts in the sense that you, you've, you've crossed so many topics from cinema to, to environments, building environments, elaborating on pictures and participation. And so um, maybe I will start with a question that was just uh, typed on the chat, which is how can people participate in your workshops? <laughs> Cinema. So uh, the easiest way I think it's to keep track of our Instagram because we we posting our upcoming events and they happening in um, different part of, of parts of the world and online offline and it's always different for example for this hong kong workshop i think it was only for uh, hong kong residents only and yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, always different, so it's better to stick with Instagram. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Instagram. I, yeah. I also think if you don't want to wait uh, for the announcement on Instagram, you can ask uh, some local institutions to invite us to make a <laughs> workshop. I think it's uh, the fastest way to get to the workshop. Yeah, reach out and express interest. We also have a Discord server yeah. that you can join and poke us there too. <laughs> I, I forgot about this card. <laughs> yeah. But he, you you have created I, 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 I Yeah, I created and uh, I'm the only guy who posted there, but I forgot about this. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, in the future, we might invite you to actually do a workshop here. I think that would be very interesting. Um, another question also from the audience. I'm, I'm going to post it here on the chat. Maybe it's better for you to actually see it. 
I'll read it. So with regards to volumetric cinema, do you think strategies to mitigate VR-induced motion sickness will always need to be factored in to create into the creative process? Mm. And there's a second part to that question, which I'm now posting. Or do you concern that uh, will eventually dissipate once more people become accustomed to the technology? That's really interesting because you're 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 con connecting volumetric cinema with VR. I think volumetric cinema doesn't necessarily have to live in VR, but I think the concerns about VR will always be there. Um, there's some interesting studies from the neurophysics lab at UCLA that um, they study VR's effect on uh, the brain in mice, and they see that 60% of the hippocampus shuts down in VR. So I think that will always be the case because our bodies require more than two senses to have a perception of space. I think VR will always have, uh, you know, mess up our body's inputs. Um, but I think volumetric cinema can exist not just in VR. I think maybe XR might be a more um, feasible place for it to function. It can also exist on a screen. It doesn't, the, the tool, the way that we experience volumetric cinema isn't really bound by um, one specific screen interface. Yeah, I have more radical feeling about that um but it may it's it's not like near future but right now i i'm afraid to say that it's not in the near future because for example our current uh we were expecting like 20 30 at least five but, uh yeah but it's uh 2023 right now it, almost everything kind of happened so uh, I think that VR is a, is just in between step bit, uh, where uh, so I, I think all these environments 3D or all these things at some point they will be right happening right inside our brains uh, without this you know I interactions like because right now VR is just a small LCD screen in front of your eyes, which sounds like a um, like something not really um, not really volumetric, yeah. <laughs> not really volumetric, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in in case of, for example, this neural networks blast and um, nerve. For example, yeah, they, they have uh, on the bottom layer, they have neural structure, yeah? And in your brain, you have neural structure. So maybe at some point they will find a way to interact uh, with each it's other. Uh, yeah, directly. <laughs> but it's super scary. Yeah, actually it's uh, quite interesting research uh, on how the transformer uh, neural networks uh perceive the sp spatial mm. information like uh, up down uh, and mm. so on this this concept and uh, it's pretty similar to how our brain uh captured this uh, concept so who knows maybe it's real yeah. uh real I... future <laughs> Re uh, it will really merge together I, I agree with what um, Yancy was saying, you know, like we used to have the age of computers and then laptops, but then we see China completely leapfrog, skip that phrase and jump into the mobile phone era. And then maybe tomorrow Africa doesn't even use the mobile phone. They'll just use some other devices that we can't even imagine. So yeah. It, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's not just like a horseless carriage that becomes a car, but something that you can't imagine. Yeah, maybe VR will stop making us sick once we can input all senses from the user yeah. interface. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we can also connect these ideas that we are that you are discussing also with this idea of uncanny valley, right? At which mm -hmm. point are we getting used to all these new technologies? And um, you also mentioned in the in the talk that there is. Um, we are going through a moment in which these tools are being democratized, right? Everyone has access to them. And so how, how do you see these, uh, these sudden transitions and uh, 
at which point do you think we are? Or do you think that people are getting used to this or is it just too confusing, too scary as um, uh, Yanzi also mentioned a bit that some topics are just too scary at this, at this point? How do you feel about this? I, 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 I think it's kind of like when Claude Shannon um, came up with the binary digits, he didn't know that we would have artificial intelligence in a small computer mobile phone sort of situation. So we don't understand the consequences of what we're doing. We don't understand the implications. And yeah, it, it's scary, not because of the tool, but because we don't understand and no one's really looking closely at the consequences of our own doing. So. So another topic that I wanted to bring to the discussion and that you briefly mentioned at the end is this idea of participation, right? So you mentioned, so you started with uh, volumetric cinema and at some point you were discussing how we are able to create these environments. So how do you see the participation of users into to building these shared environments in which each one of us can actually contribute to the environment? Um, also a bit related, you briefly mentioned the, the the idea of metaverse, which at this point also makes sense to 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 bridge in, right? And uh, how do you see that people can actually bring and build these shared environments, which are shared by many people? Yeah, that's a great question. I think when we were first discussing it in 2019, um, metaverse wasn't even a term. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, but actually we were discussing uh, the the metaverse, but we just didn't have no. Uh, it's called metaverse. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, but one one thing that I I think we were all really excited about, and it's a convergence point in the film. If you guys watch it, is this kind of idea that every user live streams their own environment three dimensionally. So like the ability to actually bring whatever space we're in in three D and in this collective space, and how does that um, become a, a foundational groundwork for participating and collaborating from. So yeah, our um, like visualization of that was uh, like the different streams uh, intersecting with each other and forming the space uh, for for the people sharing um, the same. Basically, yeah, it's a meeting point of their uh, streams. Uh, let's say, and that could be people or polar bears or environments. Like it could, it doesn't need to necessarily be human agents, right? Like self-driving cars are also reconstructing spaces all the time. So being able to switch between these different three-dimensional streams, um, and what does that do in terms of participation? Maybe provides can speak to that. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, now that I think about it, it's such an important question because just just by streaming 3D data into the same environment, it's awesome, but it doesn't really have any meaning. It, 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 it just, it's just like data compression or semantics is irrelevant even when Shannon was writing the, the first white paper, right? So I, I even the term metaverse has no meaning. It, it's trying to harness on the financial industry of video gaming, but still I go buy video games every week and I don't even pay a dime in a metaverse. And I, I think it's because there's no meaning in metaverse right now. It's trying to bootstrap community engagement. It's trying to advertise. It's trying to say that it will be the future, but the future has to have this semantic cultural side where every one of us can connect, not just people who speak English, but, you know, Chinese backgrounds, Arabic backgrounds, African backgrounds. And now that has not been embedded. It has not been an inclusive, accessible tools. And that's why it, it hasn't become a cult or subcult or culture yet. And I think that, that that's probably the biggest issue that maybe Zuckerberg has to solve, like why Facebook has culture and Metaverse doesn't have culture. Uh, and yeah, the recent uh, news from from that field that this uh, all these metaverse uh, guys they they becoming a gaming platforms. So yeah. the word metaverse just like shrinking back again. <laughs> you need to be their gaming. Yeah. So it, it's it's a process of like. Forming, shaping the 
this thing that we don't really understand. Yeah, that's why I think we will go through different stages, namings, and so on. And yeah, yeah probably it will look like something we can't imagine. <laughs> let, let me just add this one more thing. So um, when, when Board and Computer first got on the desk in the 80s, it created the dot-com bubble because there was no two-way communication. There was no platform. Right. That that's why the financial assessment of the actual tool was actually much bigger than the actual social value. And in 20 years, uh, in the 2000, after there was the bubble, people realized oh, actually we need to get user to actually be able to uh, input in the space. Right. So 20 years. And since the start of virtual reality tools like metaphor stuff, it was also the 2000s and now it's 20 years. So I think Zuckerberg sort of see this. I, mean, I don't know him. But you know this twenty-year time frame, it should have been more compressed, right? Because we're 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 going faster exponentially. But it just doesn't doesn't something's not right, you know. Yeah, I have to say I, I'm very skeptic about this metaverse thing, and it was mm -hmm. um, rather a provocation than actually. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very skeptic. But um, it, it has hand, its its own. Uh, like function in the history, let's say, yeah, because it mm. metaverse what was the reaction for the COVID and for um, the lack of um, instruments and people, like, yeah, to connect yeah. people, mm. and it yeah, was yeah. a nice attempt actually. It's not it's not a bad thing because right now we have a lot of these uh, like platforms where you can interact spatial like out. Audio, spatial audio, like three dimension things happening. Yeah, and human so... reconstruction and a lot of uh, tools was developed uh, because of metaverse. But uh, the metaverse itself itself didn't develop into <laughs> the thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just the first step, and uh, it will happen uh, later. But uh, who knows <laughs> how it will be. So I have two more questions, and um, so, so the first is to shift a bit to the beginning of your presentation, in which you started by by discussing some work of art. So, for example, you've shown uh, Las Meninas, I think, from Velázquez, and how yeah. um, you can elaborate in in this uh, work of art. And for me, it's uh, it's very interesting this idea that you can actually produce content and go beyond this initial, uh, the starting point, right? You have a work of art and how can you transmediate this, this work of art that's in 2D into a 3D environment and with that build new narratives. So that for me, it's very interesting. Do, do, do you have plans to keep on working in this, in this and do, how, how do you pick the work of arts that, or would you pick the work of arts that you would work on? I'm not sure if the, this uh, makes sense as a question, but for me, it's a very interesting, this idea of elaboration. Yeah, um, f first of all, just to clarify, the, the the 3D modeling was actually done by other people. So we, we put their references down at the bottom, but yeah, I completely agree with you. So just X, Y axes, and now we make it 3D, so we're adding one layer of information that's actually exponentially more um, from these ad axes. Yeah, that's why we when that when we tie that back to the time voxel, we realize it's compressing into a model and then expand that into um, reality. Yeah, that that I think. Sorry, the original question. Uh, um, you mean the the work with the. Um, Las Meninas. Works so far, yeah. Uh, so, so, so my question was more in terms of um, how do you see you getting this initial material, and it can be, for example, 2D, and out of them expanding, right? So this idea of actually using these uh, machine learning techniques to actually go beyond mm. that, that work of art actually shows. And in my opinion, it, it has a lot of potential to create new narratives, which I think we briefly mentioned, right? 
out of a, a small picture, we can actually look around and try to have the machine actually build something that's not true, right? The, the, for example, in painting, we don't have the painter actually paint what's uh, round, or most painters probably don't, even though they imagine. But all of a sudden, we can elaborate on that and actually create new narratives. So, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I actually had a question for that, but I would be interested in knowing if this is something that you would uh, like to 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 build on that, because for me it was a very interesting topic at the, the beginning of your presentation. I think In... a great example of uh, how you can work with these pieces of art uh, with uh, the neural network is. Uh, this in painting models uh, that are in Dali or in stable diffusion. Or uh, out painting, use... yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 or out painting. So you can uh, uh, transform the original media, original uh, uh, painting uh, into something uh, bigger, like you can reconstruct the whole room uh, and uh, by combining them with um, uh depth map uh, reconstruction uh, neural networks you can also add the spatial uh, di uh, dimension yeah you know, like third dim dimension so uh i think it, it's uh, it's one of the way how you can work with it uh i'm not sure if uh, we are planning to do <laughs> that but uh, uh i think it's always we, part we of we definitely our can uh, experiment with it yeah yeah uh, all of this uh, neural network we uh, like use in the workshops in our workshops so uh, we can uh, think on this topic yeah and uh, maybe i like how uh, uh, this for example out painting it it works not with the initial image it was uh, it works with the context uh in of this image, yeah. When you zoom out, you see like another context in the frame, frame of another context, uh, and yeah, this is uh, really interesting in terms of logic. How you can change the subject just by changing everything around it and uh, mm -hmm. produce another meaning. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's even more fun when you uh, know the history, how this uh, in painting and out painting uh, models was developed. Because right now, because of uh, the clip, uh, the neural network that can translate from like uh, image to text and uh, backwards, uh, you can analyze the whole image. But before, uh, to reconstruct uh, like this in painting models uh, was using just the uh, tiny bit of uh, tiny region around the pixel, not the ball, uh, uh, around the picture, not the ball picture. So it reconstructed the- Oh, it has uh, no understanding of what's inside yeah, the picture. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just understand the borders. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it's actually a big progress right now. Ellie. And another thing, uh, uh, I think, Cool in, in that the same context of, about the art and how to uh, extract or add new meanings to that is this uh, how this Van Eyck uh, Arnold Finney portrait actually reminds me the this Blade Runner movie yeah it has the same like spherical mirror there and it was like um, moving the camera around that and yeah uh, explores the something that was invisible before or like obstacle uh, because of obstacle or something um yeah uh, definitely very interesting and uh, it's something that um, i would like to see much more if you keep on working uh, on that mm -hmm. i would be very interested one last question also because we are already uh, too long on time has to do with audio, right? Because uh, most of what we've seen at your presentation has to do with visual, but have you considered or have you worked on or do you plan to work on? Yeah, I can... the, yeah the audio. Uh, yeah, I can explain why we don't have uh, a lot of audio stuff because um... Uh, the neural networks that work with audio, they uh, had a 
like uh, developed uh, very actively just uh, uh, for the last couple of years uh, uh, and uh, at the moment when we started the current uh, there was uh, uh, just a couple of them that uh, was working slowly and you had to have uh, powerful computers with which are not like uh, affordable uh, and uh, the results was not that great so this is why i think uh, we didn't uh, touch uh, the sound at that point but uh, um, uh, i'm really interested in this uh, direction like uh, uh, how we can uh, uh, create this uh, infinite streams of audio how we can uh, do uh, the, mm. uh, how we can automate uh, the audio environment in the volumetric cinema as well uh, uh, because uh, like uh, uh, because of uh, this multimodal neural networks we can analyze uh, what happens in uh, the environment translate it to the text and then translate this text to sound and uh, play this sound and i think it's an interesting to uh, interesting topic and also if we speak about uh, digital personas uh, um, like it's already happen uh, happening and uh, you have a lot of tutorial on youtube how you can clone the voice how you can convert the text to speech and so on so it's a big thing yeah so. And, and another problem is uh, the presentation mode itself, because uh, mm -hmm. the sound is a linear um, way of like consuming or perceiving, receiving or perceiving, let's say, information. And yeah, it's it's really hard to like mix it with your presentation and the audio, so everybody has to stop at this point and listen to this infinite live audio live stream which is kind of yeah it's the problem to solve <laughs> that that's actually a very very important uh question because if we have the five senses then uh synthetic intelligence should be able to process all five senses and so now it's really focused on visual or textual um which is like our our mouth and our eyes. And I, I think for, from the information theory perspective, everything is just signals. It doesn't matter the meaning, right? So what what, what is stopping us from it? And I, I think one of it is, is that actually our eyes see Im everything in 2D. So it's 3D world, 2D eyes, and a 3D brain, right? But then for sound, it's different. Sound has always been three-dimensional. Um, if we close our eyes, we know that we receive signals from all direction, right? We don't turn it into 2D. So I think that's also one of the uh, technical difficulties that AI, it's currently not so good with 3D. And yeah, it's an important question. Yeah, well, sound yeah, nice point. is vibrational, right? It affects our bodies and mm. so do other signals in space. And I think this brings it back to the previous question um, you asked about AI's ability to produce narrative and AI's ability to produce good narratives, right? Narratives that affect us or move us because mm. ultimately the, the reason we like art is because it tries to communicate an emotion or feeling that we as humans have mm. vibrationally in our bodies. And I don't think AI is anywhere near being able to produce these experiences that move us, whether that's visually or through sound. Um, maybe yeah. one day we'll get it in all five senses and maybe that day is sooner yeah. than we think. Uh, but right now it's it's still in development. And then we would be a simulation ourselves. Actually, yeah. we, we um, explored, we have explored that topic when we were uh, thinking before making current and we were in Tokyo and we were talking a lot about biofeedback, uh, biofeedback loops and uh, we were talking about forgotten uh, like nose, nose part of the human, yeah, because it's uh, <laughs> it's really hard for technology right now to transmit or reproduce the, the smells, the science and so on. But there uh, in Tokyo, actually we've been to a lab where the guys were working with this artificial yeah. uh, noses. And uh, yeah, this is extremely complicated uh, part. And I think the problem is just with the technology that it's 
for example, Vajel is like dominating and uh, sounds it's also good. And then it's worse and worse, like, worse uh, and worse, yeah. yeah, and six sense is like not working at all right now. <laughs> <laughs> Only well, a woman has six yeah. sense. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Well, at the pace that things are going, I, I would imagine that pretty soon we will have development. Sure, yeah. With, uh, with, mm -hmm. uh, if not all, many of these questions, I would say. Uh, all right, so uh, please don't leave. I'm closing the session and then ending the stream, but I would like to first thank you uh, for being here. I know that you did an um, extreme effort to be all here because you are in different time zones and it's not the yeah, best. Yeah, 2 a.m. and Ellie will get 6. 2 a.m. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Um, I really appreciate that. It's very nice and it, I think it was a very interesting discussion. I would keep on going, but it's 2 a.m. for provides. Um, so, yes, yeah. I would like to thank you and uh, just going to share that the next session will be on the 26th of April, and it will be on the event CMD Talks, so not Secret Converses, but uh, CMD Talks, which is more, more related to research and to our doctoral program. And But it will happen the same, In it will be streamed to YouTube. And one difference is, is that the time will not be exactly the same. Um, but we will communicate this through our socials and